So it's my pleasure today to introduce um, Dr. William Hulbert to you. Dr. William Hulbert is a consulting professor of neurobiology at the Stanford Medical School. After receiving his undergraduate in medical training at Stanford University, he completed postdoctoral studies in theology and medical ethics. His primary areas of interest include the ethical issues associated with advancing biomedical technology, the biological basis of moral awareness, and studies in integration of theology with the philosophy of biology. So a true uh, Renaissance man, as they say. Uh, he's the author of numerous publications on science and ethics, including the co-edited volume, Altruism and Altruistic Love, Science, Philosophy, and Religion in Dialogue, and also Science, Religion, and the Human Spirit in the Oxford Handbook of Religion and Science. Dr. Hobart has also uh, taken up prominent public and political role. He has testified to the National Academy of Sciences Embryonic Stem Cell Research Guidelines Committee. And from 2002 to 2009, he served in the President's Council on Bioethics. He's a senior fellow on the, of the Center for Bioethics and Human Dignities Academy of Fellows. So please join me in welcoming um, a very honored speaker, Dr. William Herbert. Thank you very much. I want to talk with you about something a little complicated today. Um, we have a wonderful overall subject, uh, your beauty. But um, the, the realm of my foundational education and the professional work is fundamentally uh, oriented around the central axis of science. And most recently, science has been making inquiries into a range of things that had previously been limited to the humanities, and beauty is one of them. There's a whole um, subject called neuroaesthetics now. I'm going to touch on that a little. I'm also going to <coughs> explore some of the ideas of evolutionary psychology. And the dilemma that we face with this subject is that it starts to, the scientific approach starts to explain away as a kind of mechan in a mechanistic sort of way what it is that's going on in our lives psychologically, not just physically, but psychologically and spiritually. And although I'm not going to be too explicit about this, by the time I get to the end, I hope you understand that the world is mysteriously um, material, moral, and spiritual, and that all of these mechanisms that are apparent and probably validly being inquired about in science, new information, all of that could be true while nothing in in your Catholic faith, nothing in your personal identity needs to be ultimately eroded by it, just informed. So when I saw this, this little clip from the newspaper, I thought, by now I hope you've all read that, I thought, wow, this guy sure overreacted. But it does point to the fact that beauty is a matter of life and death. What a mysterious subject we have. Powerful, passionate, persuasive, right at the heart of human concern. This is a picture of a woman in Beijing undergoing a surgical procedure that's increasingly common in China, an excision of the upper part of the eyelid to create a, a rounder, fuller eye. There's a worldwide explosion in cosmetic surgery. In Brazil, business executives are getting facelifts. In France, breast augmentation has become a common high school graduation gift. In the USA, twice as many people as the population of San Francisco had cosmetic surgery last year. Facelifts, rhinoplasties, nose jobs. Nearly two million people in the United States had some kind of invasive cosmetic surgery, double the number in the year 2000, and it's still increasing. And last year, beyond serious surgeries, 14.2 million Americans had some kind of minimally invasive cosmetic procedure, including 7 million having Botox, 2.4 million having collagen treatments to sort of fill in and smooth out wrinkles and furrows. For $500, you can get what's called the Paris Lip. It's a sort of sexy pout made by injecting collagen to give the lips a fuller look. It lasts three or four months, so say it's uh, four months, 15 times three, that's $1,500 a year. One happy client said, I think of it like a good haircut. 
A recent survey showed that 65% of American women would be willing to undergo major surgery to reshape their bodies. And in 2015, over 270,000 women had breast augmentation. Liposuction is now the second most common surgical procedure in the United States, second only to abortion. Literally tons of fat are sucked out of American bodies every year at a rate of about $500 a pound. A lot more expensive getting it out than putting it in. <laughs> they do it for tummy tucks, thighs, ankles, and knees. I, I, why would you have lip, liposuction in your knee? Well, it turns out when skir skirt hems ro rose above the knee, people didn't like the way their knees looked. I, I don't know. Um, and yet even with this, the United States is only in fourth place for cosmetic surgery procedures behind Taiwan, Brazil, South Korea, and, and, and a few other places. And, the, and um, so this is really an amazing global phenomenon, very deep in the heart of human nature. Silicon implants can now reshape the nose or, or chin or give higher cheekbones or fill in hollows below aging cheekbones. Computers simulate the, the do preview, allow you to choose just the look you want. And then the computer designs it and the 3D printer prints it out for the surgeon. So it's really getting to be high tech. Beyond the estimated $13 billion spent on these surgeries, the cosmetics industry regularly posts revenues in excess of $50 billion a year. And weight the weight loss industry is more than $60 billion a year. But notwithstanding the enormous costs and significant medical risks of this, and by the way, people do die of very seemingly minor medical procedures like this. Notwithstanding the great costs and the dangers, the reshaping and molding of our external surfaces is a practice in principle as old as human history and found in all cultures. But consider this. You, you may not know what this is, actually. It's a Rogaine ad. It, this came out about, it must be 15 or 18 years ago. Rogaine, um, it, it's a medicine that goes to the very foundation of cellular function. In the fine print down here, see the way they advertise it so effectively, kind of autumn afternoon, windswept beach, aging, you know, the end of the summer. Um, aging that unattractive little spot on his he head. And, and it says, if you're losing your hair, see your doctor. And then down in the fine print, it says, if you're losing your hair, you no longer have a reason to lose hope. <laughs> this was originally uh, uh, available only through prescription. Um, but now it's available uh, over the counter in Costco for one third the price. Having entered the marketplace, through the benevolent offices of modern scientific medicine, legitimized in that way, it's now bypassed the doctor entirely. And this and the other baldness, male pattern baldness treatments uh, constitute a billion dollar a year industry in the United States. And by the way, male pattern baldness was not considered a disease when I was trained in medicine. Moreover, steroids, and here we're going deeper yet, steroids. Um, 5% of adolescent boys now use anabolic steroids, not just for sports performance, but to get a more adult and athletic appearance. And growth hormone. Um, growth hormone, and in the opposite, estrogen, is used to retard the growth of young women who are growing too tall. Uh, these go right to the heart of, of uh, hormonal function, basic physiology. But is shortness of disease? Is it, or is it a social problem? Uh, one of my colleagues who was a pioneer in growth hormone said that his, one of his very earliest patients was a doctor from UCLA who brought his son to see him and said he wanted him to have growth hormone shots, but he was five foot 10. And, and the doctor explained, but he has a great outside shot. I want him to get in the UCLA basketball team. So this is very complicated. And the current thinking on this is that 
that if you treat the lower 3%, that's sort of a legitimate social medical intervention. Um, and yet the lower 3% would be nearly 100,000 children a, ye a year, well, 100,000 over the course of years. And, and the cost of that would be, would be something around five to $10 billion to treat short stature. So what's all this about? What's driving all this? And, and why is one form of beauty more beautiful than another anyway? Here's an example of that. And what is beauty? Is it just a cultural preference? Or are there more basic biological factors involved? And why are we so astonishingly aware of appearance? That appearance matters is perfectly obvious to all of us. Within a given culture, there are generally clear standards of physical attractiveness. And it seems that when it, within every culture, even though standards of beauty may vary to some degree, there are benefits associated with attractiveness. I, I know this is true because this, this is a genetic disorder. And this little girl has, has uh, uh, suffered brain damage at birth due to an accident. There's nothing genetically wrong with her. Her damage is actually much greater in her functioning of life than, than the previous person, patient I showed you. But this little girl was, was uh, she suffered, she was breached, her, 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 which means bottom fur. She went, her, they didn't get her heart beating for nine minutes, and yet she survived. But she's mentally retarded and somewhat awkward, much better than she should have been. But uh, this little girl, because she's beautiful, was treated much better than the other person would have been, you see. And I know that because this is my daughter. So attractive people are seen as happier, more confident, having higher social status and success. They're seen as more interesting, educated, and intelligent. Attractive people do better in interviews. They get better evaluations and larger raises. Taller men make higher salaries. And in 80% of presidential elections, the taller candidate won. I don't know if that had to do with this, ladies. <laughs> even one-year-olds prefer to play with attractive dolls with attractive faces. And even as young as nursery school, children are responsive to the physical attractiveness of their peers. Adults are more forgiving of attractive children. Less attractive are blamed and punished more severely. Not only that, but attractive infants are given more attention, affection, eye contact, and cuddling by their own mothers. Can you imagine your mother being so capricious? Moreover, attractiveness is associated with goodness and basic worth. Attractive people who commit crimes are less likely to get caught. And if caught, they're less likely to, to get convicted. And if convicted, they receive lower punishment, lower penalty. This prejudice based on beauty or perceived lack of it may result in, conf in, in decreased confidence, decreased self-esteem, a lack of self-assertion, decreased concentration and lower performance, a sense of low ease in society, insecurity, and a sense of isolation and failure. Beauty and success go together, leading to social status and mobility. Kevin O'Kan, a Vogue makeup artist, said, I understood early that beauty was power. Subjects who met a man seated next to an extremely attractive woman tend to like him more and rate him as friendlier and more self-confident than did subjects who met the very same man sitting next to a woman who was not attractive. Physically attractive people may come to think of themselves as good or lovable because they are continually treated that way. When I was in high school, there was an ad on the radio that it was an acne ad. And it said, when you look good, you feel good. And when you feel good, you are good. <laughs> and, and yet, there's some truth to that, sad to say. There's a famous story in medicine of the so-called fish man who had sort of a sinister look. And he kept committing low-grade crimes. He'd be incarcerated. <laughs> go out, people would treat him like he was strange and evil, and then he'd commit another crime, he'd go back. Finally, he said to the authorities, 
please give me plastic surgery so I don't look like this. People will treat me better. And they did. And he never returned to prison. But bear in mind, he may not have been caught, convicted, or <laughs> sentenced to prison again. Who knows? Anyway, uh, these early self in images may reverberate right up through life and spill over into the arena of social problems, accident proneness, depression, and suicide. And I don't mean to overplay that because I know a lot of people who might be labeled unattractive rise above it and it's fantastic, but there's still that, that fundamental factor going on in human life. Social status, success, health, ostracized, shunned, even mocked. It's easy to see how beauty or lack of it plays a role in natural selection. There's an old saying, the rich always live upstream from the Cloacus Maximus. Cloaca, Cloaca Maxima, which is the major sewer outlet from the Tiber in Rome. Um, the rich, but also the beautiful, because the, beautiful, the rich like the beautiful too. It's easy to see how the beautiful would be less vulnerable to the ravages of disease, famine, and social upheaval. But what is beauty? And why is it so highly valued? It's not exactly an emotion, is it? Yet, it's not exactly rational understanding either. But it's a perception, a kind of aesthetic response. It somehow unites the power of emotion with the rightness of reason to give us a felt sense of fullness, goodness, and completion. It's the physical, aesthetic, and moral in an integrated wholeness of form and function. It unites the outward appearance with the inner quality of the thing. It seems to carry the perfect proportion and balance of natural purposes with the most transcendent human aspirations. It both fills and quickens our sense of excellence, perfection, nobility, glory, truth, and grace. And the chambered nautilus is a kind of like beauty itself even, and it's also beautiful. Chambered nautilus, um, it goes to infinity in both directions, the small and the large, and beauty is like that. Um, at the most fundamental level, there's a general sense of beauty a response to the natural world, like the pictures I just showed you. It's a kind of built-in response and appreciation. And by the way, neuro scientists who study neurosthenics have reasons why we like certain natural um, environments, landscapes, preferentially having to do with safety and food resources. And that's quite interesting. Um, yet, there's something more going on. There's something about the whole of nature, the power of nature that evokes a sense of awe of the sublime and a sense of transcendent meaning. Uh, Jane Goodall told me that she observed chimps on several occasions standing and looking out over the sunset in the, where she worked. And in, in human life, patients get, feel better when their window looks out on a pleasant natural setting. And they get better faster too, that's been documented. So this is a powerful, inner quality in human nature. Not only that, we like to eat, eat our food in the presence of, of certain types of environments, especially green plants, uh, you know, sizzler and olive garden. And even if those, are, those ferns are made of plastic, we somehow feel better while we eat. Um, moreover, there are fascinating theories that some of which are being discussed in this conference about the whole notion of the golden mean and Fibonacci's number and ways that the natural world reflects these interesting and powerful ratios that speak to the deep, deep uh, impulses of our mind. Um, but, it, but somehow that's not adequate to just say, well, beauty is powerful to us because it's part of the natural world and it's compelling. Beauty is more than just a resonant harmony with natural life processes. Because even though this is very powerful to us, this is natural too. And disgust is just the other side of the impulse of beauty. Disgust causes loathing, offense, nausea, aversion, repulsion, even horror. Beauty is attractive. It naturally draws you to it, invites intimacy, makes you want to touch it, take it to yourself, and maybe put it to your lips like babies see beautiful things, they just put them to their mouth. Um, it, it makes you almost want to embrace, in some sense, like, like being one with the thing. 
And no doubt, this beauty impulse is inseparable in some of life's most fundamental and central processes, including sexual love and the nurture of children. And children, I find my children compelling. I just have to grab them and hug them. So ugly, on the other hand, is fearful. It's threatening. It's dreadful. It's dangerous. And it's morally revolting, too. It makes you want to reject it and push it away. And even though this, this um, is not, this is benign completely, it would not affect anything in your relationship with this, this woman. It, it would probably put a man off to see this if he, like in the Victorian era, where they may have not seen the naked body before um, the wedding night. I don't know what to say to that, except that I think what I'm going to say at the end, that there's a way to transcend these kinds of impulses. But having said that, it's, it's powerful, and you can't deny it's there. Um, and it's a warning, too. It has meaning. This is, this is a form of surface syphilis, and you'd be wise to stay away from this individual. Um, one could see how these reactions would serve as strong selection against skin disease, disease of the immune system, and genetic disorders. And 1% to 2% of our population carries a genetic disease that manifests in some subtle but detectable way. The Nobel laureate Linus Pauling suggested that people with genetic diseases um, that are in recessive form and therefore not yet obvious, but if they mate with somebody who has it too, will it be expressed? He suggested that they get tattooed somewhere that's not immediately visible, but visible at some point in courtship so that they could detect the presence of this carrier state and then not marry that person. Um, in my classes, we had various debates on where in the body that little tattoo ought to be. <laughs> um, but, but in any case, um, what, what, however interesting and silly that idea may be, in fact, nature in many cases has already done this for us. And people um, carry these marks of disorder not as fair and open communication, but as signs of shame and degraded personal dignity. They would like to hide them, not show them off. Throughout history and across cultures, physical deformity has been equated with moral disorder, sin, and wrath. These prodigies of nature were seen as punishments or prophecies of calamity. Then with the naturalism of the Enlightenment and the rise of scientific medicine in the end of the 19th century, a more objective and dispassionate attitude seemed proper. The freak shows of the early 19th, of, of the 19th century and early 20th century were a kind of transition from the horror to curiosity toward compassionate acceptance. And I re, I'm old enough to remember my father was actually um, a, doc, a doctor and actually took care of many people from Barnum and Bailey. They wanted him to become the Barnum and Bailey doctor, but he said no. But we always got tickets, and I'd go down to Madison Square Garden and. I saw this, this, this uh, freak show, so-called, and they were very interesting, but they were a little scary, and, and, um, and there was, it, it wasn't completely effective because even now, adults find a queasy fascination and children are repugnant horror at these kind of disorders. Um, tall man's, morphologically, he's normal, so he's not repulsive, he's just a curiosity, but a guy like this with ectrodactyly malformation of the fingers is sort of disturbing to, to see, I think, even to adults. Um, and and uh, this is obesity, which is also a disorder and dis disturbing to us. Um, so with the naturalism, the enlightenment, we tried to move on, but it wasn't easy. And people naturally do this. They naturally ostracize or hide lack of beauty. Dr. Donald Laub, the founder of Interna Interplast International, an organization that brings reconstructive surgery to the third world, speaks poignantly of this. He told me that his very first patient, uh, a small boy with a cleft palate, was brought to his open air clinic in Tijuana with a paper bag over his head. His parents were so ashamed. We seem by nature unable to disconnect physical disorder from a sense of revulsion and moral disorder. Even superficial differences may be seen as danger. The terrible toll of racism, ranging from the subtle sense of social superiority to blatant barbarism, is testimony to the power of aesthetics. And here I don't mean to imply that racism is solely um, 
a matter of appearance, but there are theories that <coughs> what drives racial conflict is most fundamentally genetic competition. Even the objectivity of the age of science could not go deep enough to reach below the inbuilt prejudice and its moral imp impulse, or one might say its immoral impulse. Along with the history of biological uh, evolution came parallel theories of social evolution, which enshrined the aesthetic standards of their proponents, leading directly to eugenics and to the horror of Nazi Germany. We all know the history of that. I'll return to this uh, matter of appearance and racism, but for the moment, we need to ask ourselves, what is it about beauty that works so forcefully in our lives? What is it that causes us to make such harsh judgments and inflict such cruelties on other, other human beings? And from a less appalling but similarly strange perspective, what is it that causes us to afflict ourselves with such an intense personal preoccupation with appearance and the urgent, painful, and costly quest of the ideal image? If we look at the animal kingdom, animal species, for some understanding of the role of appearance in evolution, we can see immediately the important relationship between form and function. In fact, the word species comes from the Latin word, which means the look of a thing. And the look of an organism as is, is as important as any internal organ. Complex integrated genetic programs produce and modulate the dynamic processes of appearance. Color, pattern, and form play crucial roles in survival. Camouflage, warning systems, this blue is a warning not to eat it because it contains a toxin, and deception. Um, that's actually a bug, not a leaf on the far right. Um, these, these, not only that, but beauty forms um, signals of species identity and social communication and mates for mate selection. Darwin recognized that preference in mating could also direct the course of evolution by favoring certain traits. Um, he thought that this might account for the extraordinary exotic features such as peacock tails. This is, this, these slides are supposed to be mate selection. Um, how does the, how does the uh, zebra know to mate with another zebra and not an antelope. Um, so Darwin had this idea that, that the female would get interested and attracted to this, the, whatever it is about the peacock's tail, and then that peacock would be rewarded, and the next one have even more and more and more. So it's called an idea of runaway evolution. Uh, this would account for peacock's tails, bright colors in animals, birds especially, and huge antlers that have no apparent survival value and may even be a liability. He wrote, it is impossible to doubt that the female, that females admire the beauty of their male partners. Later studies have confirmed the important role of both male and female choice in sex selection uh, and the higher rates of offspring production associated with certain morphologies and, col and colors. By the way, it's the female that does most of the choosing in the natural order. Uh, and a good example of what I'm talking about is the, is the barn swallow. The female will mate preferentially with a male that has a long and symmetrical tail. Those with long tails pair more quickly and leave more offspring. Th what happens is the female watches from her perch as the males swoop by her, and she's turned on by the beauty of emotion. Symmetry and tail length are indications of good genes, no inbreeding, and parasite resistance. In barn swallows, there's a disease-carrying mite, little, little bug, a disease-carrying mite that affects the symmetry of the tail more than any other feathers or ornaments. So if you have a genetic disposition that can resist that mite, um, you, you have a longer tail and therefore more attractive to the female. And that's an, indicate, an honest indicator that you'd be a better mate. Um, in this case, one might say that might does not make right. <laughs> Such a system is evolutionary very complicated. It requires an evident trait that's an honest indicator of superior genetic makeup, as well as 
the, the response, corresponding res response to the indicator and a preference. But there are numerous examples of this in the ethological literature. Just to give you one other, there's a fly, and the flies mate preferentially based on those little tiny spines coming out of the front of the head. But what would you say about this? How does this relate to human beings? Aren't we creatures of culture and complex and subtle communications? Um, interestingly, both of, both of these have their antecedents in animal species as well. The bowerbirds, a fascinating case. Uh, more complex indicators of beauty. The female selects her bedmate, and by the way, the bower is not a, a nest, it's a, it's a, of a courtship uh, quarters. Um, the female selects her mate based on the quality of his bower, the number of decorations, because they go around and find all sorts of bright objects, and conformity to certain decorating rules that appear to be genetically wired in. So it's a comprehensive test of genes. It tests mechanical dexterity, good brains, good visions, good memory, and dominance, since other males are constantly trying to steal the shiny objects from their competitors and wreck the bowers of their competitors. It's a real frenzy. A whole range of capacities, dexterity, attention, acuity, competitive strengths. We thought human adolescence was difficult. <laughs> so while most birds, and use body ornamentation for sexual display, bowerbirds, like humans, display objects, ornaments, as indicators of superiority. It's kind of wealth, power to control resources, like owning a Porsche. It's very similar. This has its antecedent to animal ki kingdom. It's a use of beauty outside of self for self-oriented purposes. And here we come to a major factor in the scent of evolutionary complexity. Increased use of symbolism, coupled with an increase in subtle communications. A few more of the Bauer. Look at all that guy. That guy's a big success. Um, the foundations of this basic biology of display, and, and nature has found amazingly ingenious ways to convey information of great biological significance in display. This featherless part of the turkey indicates internal states of hormones, as does the back end of the chimp, indicating um, sexual uh, openness and fertility. Skin texture and color indicate hormonal states, show muscles and nerves to, to uh, reveal st brain states with facial expressions, um, states of inner mind, a deeper look inside, revealing states of desire or disgust. This allows a much more complex social reality, increased community, balance of prestige, dominance, and social advantage. All this complexity of beauty and disgust related to survival and basic issues of sex selection. So to go on, what does this have to do with human beings? Are we above all this? Can we transcend these basic impulses, you know, be lured by them to some extent, but go on? And, and what more might be going on in human mate selection and, and basic biological issues. What is the ultimate basis of human physical attractiveness anyway? Two assumptions are prominent among my students at Stanford. Uh, one, that standards of beauty are both culturally specific and vary totally between cultures. And two, that concern for beauty is stronger in the United States. You believe that. But both are wrong, it turns out. Um, U.S. college students are less concerned about beauty than one-third of non-Western cultures, most specifically those places where there's heavy parasite burden, which promotes concern for appearance. And second, individuals, with regard to the universality, individuals rated by members of their own cultures as beautiful are, tend to be rated likewise by other cultures. Another false assumption is that males are more concerned about beauty and females are less so. Oh, well, in a way that's true but because beauty may indicate, be hinge on different indicators. Males look for indications of fertility and good genes. Females look for indicators of ability to accrue and control resources, but also place major emphasis on physical evidence of good genes. 
It's true that females respond to male faces differently at different phases of the menstrual cycle, actually. And during mid-cycle, they're more attracted to males with the distinguishing characteristics of the strong chiseled chin. Well, not, not that guy. Um, <laughs> strong chiseled chin and stronger jaw. Um, at other times in their cycles, more, they're attracted to more pedomorphic, um, friendlier, safer characteristics. And females are very attentive to confidence, competence, and capability. They're extremely sensitive to depression, which is revealed in the eyes as another kind of beauty evocation or lack thereof. Likewise, it's obvious that standards of beauty vary greatly worldwide. So what are we to make of that? Um, that culture plays a major role in beauty is, is uh, interpreted within a whole set of values and social symbols. Um, but are there any universals, any basic biological pre-cultural factors going on? Recent studies have established that there are very early and perhaps innate appearance preferences and that these basic features are universally aff affirmed. According to theories of evolutionary psychology, just as our anatomy and physiology function optimally for our survival and reproduction, likewise natural selection would shape our behaviors, including our perceptions and inclinations of desire and response. Both male and female would evolve psychological mechanisms that selectively detect and respond to specific characteristics indicate, indicative of mate value. States of attraction and desire would operate to promote behavior that serves in the propagation of our genes. By this kind of thinking, beauty is a kind of information processing, problem solving machinery, an adaptive mechanism working in our genetic self-interest. Because we are nearly hairless creature, in the warm climate of our early evolution, we could be alert to the tiniest changes in surface and form of our naked bodies. This allowed the skin surface and the body form to communicate crucial information concerning age, sex, and states of health and fertility. Two obvious universals uh, are indicators of age and sex differentiation. Here, in this case, a, a female with a beard is somehow disturbing, um, probably not very pr promoting of selection. Another important indicator in human judgment of beauty is the waist-hip ratio. Across, try and figure out which one you think is the prettiest there. Um, across cultures, age, gender, people rate number seven, point seven, as the ideal. Waist and buttocks is, are uniquely human features. None of the great apes, orangutans, or gorillas have either. And sexual dimorphism and the distribution of fat distinguish male and female shapes after puberty. Under the influence of estrogens, females distribute fat peripherally to the buttocks and thighs, the gluteofemoral region, a gynoid pattern, whereas males, on the other hand, under the influence of androgens, lose fat from the gluteofemoral region and accumulate it over the abdomen and upper torsos. Because our species is relatively hairless, even small differences can be recognized and the waist-hip ratio can be seen from every angle. The waist-hip ratio is an accurate indication of reproductive endocrine states, health, fecundity, and in the female, capacity to sustain pregnancy and lactation. While cultural standards vary with regard to the amount of bulkiness considered beautiful, um, there's a similar one with males, but it doesn't quite hold up. But uh, that, that was to show you that, that uh, apes don't have waist-hip ratio. Um, while the cultural standards vary with regard to the amount of bulkiness uh, considered beautiful, for a given individual, the waist-hip ratio remains the same through a range of weights. Um, and it's very, we see this very quickly, like, is this a male or a female? I ask my students that and they point out, no, it's neither, it's a bunch of lines. But it's very easy to say that that is a female, not a male. So it takes very little information to communicate this. Um, and so Renoir's newts, for example, had optimal waist-hip ratios, even though they were chunkier. 
Turns out that the Miss America and Playboy centerfolds from the 1920s to the present show a consistent ideal of waist hip ratio, though the proportion of body fat may vary according to the fashion, which interestingly relates to the economic conditions. Fuller bodies are preferred during times of economic adversity. The gluteofemoral pattern, the so-called essential fat, is crucial to health and much to the grief of the cellulite self-conscious, virtually impossible to diet or exercise off. It's a kind of insurance policy, the essential energy reserve to provide for successful pregnancy and early nourishment of the infant. It seems understandable that males would evolve a preference, conscious or unconscious, for females with this easily visible, honest indicator of fitness. Interestingly, IVF studies have showed that for every 10% deviation from the optimal in the waist hip ratio, the probability of successful pregnancy declines by 30%. So this seems to be an example of this seems to be an example of how an innate human response that plays an important role in the relationship of beauty and mate choice might work. But beyond these indicators of biological mate quality, human apprehension of beauty, there seems to be something going on at a broader and more basic level. The Mendi of West Africa have a saying, of all things in the world, people are the most beautiful and faces are the most beautiful of all. The great art historian Kenneth Clark looked at the issue of feminine beauty across Western history. He says that in the second millennium BC, an ideal image of beauty is evident in Egyptian art that has resonated throughout history right up to the present. This ideal is characterized by a short upper lip, ears far back, smooth transitions between features, large eyes, and small noses. Nefertiti, uh, we all recognize her as having a beautiful face. Um, but what is amazing is that the same image of beauty is to some extent common to all humanity, right up through history. Interestingly also, beauty, these beautiful forms were often put on coins, the two kinds of, of beauty and power. Studies of, with infants as young as two to three months old uh, demonstrate infant preferences for faces rated by adults as attractive. These preferences cross categories of age, race, and gender in both viewer and faces viewed, suggesting that some basic features of facial beauty transcend the particulars of culture and familiarity. The ability of young infants to discriminate attractiveness in such diverse forms is all the more remarkable given that rather the rather substantial difference in the structure of male and female, white and black, and adult and infant faces. Some critics have argued that this is just a response to symmetry, that, that um, and in fact, it does matter. Symmetry in humans correlates with inbreeding, premature birth, mental retardation, and psychosis. Symmetry, by the way, is common in schizophrenics, asymmetry. Um, but studies indicate that while asymmetry, such as craniofacial abnormalities, decrease beauty, beauty may also decrease when attractive faces are made more perfectly symmetrical. Another suggestion is that infants do a kind of learned averaging, that they average the faces around them and that average faces therefore appear to be more attractive. This is also a reasonable theory because by seeking the average in a mate, one avoids the danger of genetic mutation through, through implied by the extremes. If you're very different from the rest of the people, you might have something going on genetically. Studies show, however, that average faces made from composites can be enhanced in attractiveness by accentuating certain features. These apparently universal beauty indicators include a higher forehead, small nose, larger eyes, and shorter distance between the nose and the mouth mouth and the chin. These findings hold true whether it's male or female faces that are being viewed. Interestingly, features traditionally regarded as racially related, including nostril width and lip size, did not affect basic attractiveness ratings worldwide. However, this universal 
criterion for facial attractiveness did not extend utterly to the romantic ideals of body types. There, there were certain differences in preferences, at least in mating choice. In fact, spouses tend to, these are composite faces, and that's the symmetry faces. Denzel Washington is a very symmetrical face. Um, and this shows the difference between an average and idealized. Most people consider the one on the right more beautiful. Um, but then back to body size. Um, spouses, body shape. Spouses tend to resemble each other slightly but significantly on many physical measures. These include, include the, and, and if you think about this in your own experience, you may be kind of turned more attracted or even turned off by similarities or differences in certain people. Um, ear lobes hang down or go straight, length of the middle fingers, circumference of the wrist. Some people just don't like people with thick wrists, just not attracted to them. Distance between the eyes, lung volume. Um, another one is whether your arm goes straight or sort of angles back, um, whether your second toe is farther beyond the first toe. These are things people care about, actually, and they tend to mate with people more similar to themselves. This is called the principle of optimal intermediate similarity. It appears to sustain the right balance. It has a genetic function. It sustains the right balance between the dangers of inbreeding and excessive outbreeding with the loss of beneficial traits. Here, learned averaging and rejection of prospective mates with extreme features may play an unconscious role in mate selection. But beneath these factors, there seems to be a second filter more fundamental and universal criteria of facial attractiveness based on the simple proportions and properties listed above, the, the facial features I described. If these features are somehow associated with traits that affect successful mating and fitness of offspring, then this preference for non-average faces would exert a directional selection pressure away from the population mean. In other words, if there's something about the ideal, most beautiful faces, those will make small but progressive increases in the population. Only a 1% survival advantage translates in, in just 50 generations out into, um, into a majority of change. So um, this is crucial stuff. But what valuable trait could these facial beauty features be a sign of? Positive trait may be the very face that is being selected for, or put it in different biological terms, whatever is making the face, the ideal form, may indicate a genetic program that is affecting lots of things at once. It's just the one of the factors that this basic genetics is affecting. And this is very true, by the way, the nature of genetics, because um, genes do many things in the body Practically no traits, red hair, red hair is one that's true, but practically no traits are caused by just one gene. Most are caused by, by a dozens of genes or whole gene programs. So that whatever is affecting facial features would affect a lot of other things as well. Um, so it may be that the universals of facial attractiveness are the proportions and features of what's called neoteny. And here I'm, it's a little speculative what I'm telling you, but it is interesting to think about. This term, which means holding youth, refers to the idea first prop proposed by Dutch anatomist Louis Bolk in the 1920s that human evolution has been characterized by a shift in developmental timing of certain crucial features. We seem not to have been advanced along the extension of the basic primate lineage and sort of further extending it, but rather our species characterized by holding the juvenile form of the adult uh, the adult form. And this is evident in this. The, the infant form looks a lot more like a, like a human being than the snouty adult form of the chimp. Um, we see, as Stephen Jay Gould writes, or wrote, <laughs> man has the most protracted period of infancy, childhood, and ju juvenility of all forms of life. 30% of our lifespan is devoted to growing. These changes of neoteny, these held features of youthful form, 
involve over 20 important characteristics, including a centrally located foramen magnum, that's the space that the spinal cord goes through, so it allows a, a more upright posture, includes retracted snout with a smaller jaw and a straight, small, and hairless face, large relative eye size, and a rounded bulbous cranium. Um, these external morphological changes are accompanied by new capacities in the integrated organization of the inner life and outward behaviors that characterize our species. In other words, whatever the genetic program is, not just affecting the appearance, but the behavior in the mind as well. Our lengthened childhoods and delayed sexual maturation result in longer dependence and longer social learning. Conrad Lorenz wrote, the character which is so vital for human peculiarity of the true human person, that of always remaining in a state of development, is quite certainly a gift which we owe to the neotenous nature of mankind. In other mammals, exploration, play, and flexibility behavior are qualities of juveniles, only rarely of adults. We retain not only the anatomical stamp of childhood, but its mental flexibility as well. We remain the learning animal, flexible, adaptable, and open to change all through our lives. We remain like children to the world. It has been noted that in breeding domesticated animals for behavioral traits, playfulness, and pliant behavior, we have inadvertently fostered the morphological features that accompany, th that accompany these traits, in other words, that are the more, youth more youthful form. And these are the juvenile forms versus the adult forms, and we've bred our animals, domesticated animals to look more like the juvenile forms all the way across. As Stephen, um, So, so what happens is these morphological features are very powerful to the human psyche. They seem to trigger innate releasing mechanisms for affection and nurturing, causing, as Conrad Lawrence states, an automatic surge of disarming tenderness. And one can see this in, in certain, certain as it, it, my students always go, ah, oh, when they see that. Um, and Gould pointed out that, that's cute too, isn't it? Um, Gould pointed out that throughout the history of Mickey Mouse, the, they figured out that he was a more appealing fi uh, character, the more neotenous he looked. That he went from being rodent-like to being more baby-like. Human neonate features appear to display the least cultural, uh, the least cross-cultural variation. In other words, um, children tend to look more similar across cultures than, their, than the adults in their cultures. In, in other words, they're more universal child appearance. And we, we res when a child doesn't look like a child, we don't respond to them the same way. This is a case of progeria where in young children age very rapidly. I, I participated in an autopsy of a child who died like a wizened old man at seven years old. Um, but that he was not, did not look like a baby. Um, when he died, or, or, or even early in his life. Um, so we respond to the childness of children and universally. And that would have high moral, that obviously indicates high uh, biological moral value because if, if people respond to the baby, if it's a strong releaser of affection, then the baby will be protected more as a child. This primary attractive value seems to carry its persuasive power on into adult life uh, and our response to faces and to influence our sense of beauty in areas including mate selection. The major changes that neoteny brings have in fact favored the evolution of the face as a hairless face-to-face -face canvas of self-expression and communication as well as the visual system and neurologic apparatus to process the subtle moods and meanings it portrays. In other words, the point is that the, f the hairlessness or the relative hairlessness of our primate ancestors allows for a kind of communication and therefore interpersonal interaction that was not possible. So that's another feature, hairlessness, light hair distribution is a quality of neoteny as well. Uh, there are 30 facial muscles in the human face that now can be 
used as indicators of inner states of mind and expression that could not happen if your face was covered with fur. And faces are very powerful. Um, what happens with regard to human history is the snout retracted, the face flattened, the cranium increased in size. This allowed bi bilateral stereoscopic vision, improved visual processing, the hairlessness of our face allowed deeper communication. And we all know something shines out of faces. Um, earliest infants have a preference for looking at faces, and recent studies in neuroscience have established that there are specific areas in the human mind, human brain, identified as ensembles of cells that respond to faces. We're highly sensitive to the, the dynamic changes and emotional expressions of faces. Faces seem to embody spirit, kindness, courage, sensitivity, nobility, new levels of beauty that transcend the more basic biological purposes of appearance. This in turn allows personal identity, a sense of self, and the shared sense of community we call ethics. The implications of all this are amazing. If our unique qualities as a species relate to neoteny, it's easy to see how natural selection would make use of our sense of beauty to move evolution in the right direction. We are stirred and attracted by the indicators of neoteny. Large eyes, bulbous cranium, less hairiness and upright form. And we are especially attentive to and turned off by the indicators of the evolutionary forms that have left behind the protruding snout, um, wide lips and nose dimensions, slanting foreheads, hairiness, and hunched stature. There is a saying in, in uh, a tribal saying in New Zealand, there is no woman for a hairy man. I, I don't know about that, but, <laughs> but anyway, you know what I'm talking about here. So does this preference for neoteny imply the continuing process of a kind of positive feedback loop that will influence further human evolution? It's interesting that when we picture creatures more advanced than ourselves, like E.T. and other aliens, they always have these neotenous features in exaggerated forms. Large bulbous foreheads, large eyes, small nose, and hairless skin. Somehow we associate these with higher order intelligence. One might raise the objection, however, that, get off those guys, one might raise the objection that a universal basis of attraction based on neoteny might be counterproductive and might provoke, promote um, attraction to, to faces indicating um, more youthful reality and therefore not appropriate for mating, uh, including might even promote uh, inclinations toward pedophilia. And I think that's, by the way, scientifically worth investigating, whether some people are drawn more deeply to this form um, naturally. Um, and therefore attracted to children. Uh, after all, the ads use this image very prominently. Furthermore, what are we to make of the obvious racial and cultural preferences that play so forcefully and cruelly in human beauty preference? Perhaps what's happened here is that nature has centrally put the neotenous features and then on top of them more peripherally added features that indicate uh, secondary qualities. First, we find out, is this person attractive? Are they, do they have the basic core of humanity? And second, then, we look, do they have the features of sexual maturity and cultural um, and, and so forth? So that it could be that there are many layers of, of attraction. And beauty plays out in this way um, within any normal mate selection process. Now, what are we to make then of the differences worldwide in, in body forms? Why wouldn't there be a central universal standard? Well, it turns out that different circumstances, different type body types are, are beneficial and therefore have been filtered and preserved in natural selection. Uh, squattier bodies are, retain heat better in the Arctic regions and tall, thin bodies disperse it. Um, wider nostrils can breathe better in the humid air of the tropical regions. 
and the epicanthal fold in Asians may protect against the, the dust storms, which are prominent in, in um, East Asia. So there are good reasons. The question then becomes, is there a core humanity, or are these just fundamental, um, fundamental divergences? Well, it turns out that the various species of, the various um, lineages of our species are like the breeds of dogs, that if you, if you back mate them, they quickly revert to the more universal um, human form. And Time Magazine ran a whole picture, a whole story on this, and this represents the universalized human form when you blend the, the, the various human uh, features across the world. It's a really fascinating thing that this, this is what core humanity looks like. I wouldn't be surprised if that's what the Virgin Mary looks like centrally representing our humanity. So what is it? Why do we then reject this central core of humanity if we can see into it? And why do we react to each other so forcefully and cruelly? Well, that's another layer of human, human life represented both genetically and culturally. We distinguish ourselves by various groups. We associate, you know the idea here, that cultures form bonds of coalition and over and against other people. Uh, nonetheless, beauty everywhere expresses itself distinctively. There's a huge preoccupation with beauty. This picture is from, from Jamaica. They spend a huge proportion of their impoverished economics on beauty, as do people most everywhere. Uh, they put up a beauty parlor before they put up a clinic. And beauty is used to indicate all sorts of other things, other factors. It's a kind of a dance of style that filters our capacities. And this, again, could be, could be basic biology, even though it seems like culture. Filters our capacity to be attentive to and responsive to cultural change, the dynamism of the dance of, of cultural change. So, um, we express ourselves and our ideas through beauty. Moreover, the history of beauty is very fascinating because it doesn't just go randomly along lineages or even in predictable ways along lineages. It tends to, it tends to vacillate between two extremes, um, between flamboyant artifice and naturalism. At one point, uh, any use of so-called paints, cosmetics, was completely prohibited um, in Puritan England, and yet just a century later in France, it was considered scandalous that if you didn't use makeup because not using makeup was associated with prostitution. So varying between flamboyant artifice and, and, and naturalism. Baudelaire would write, nature teaches us nothing or practically nothing. Everything beautiful as a, is a result of reason and calculation. Virtue is artificial. Good is always the product of some art. Fashion is a sublime deformation of nature, or rather a permanent and repeated attempt at her transformation. So we're strangely placed between the cradle of creation that formed our bodies and our minds and the open possibility of our capacity to transform our world and ourselves. We feel both desire and dread as we ponder the promise and peril implicit in our advancing technologies. This strange conflict between naturalism and technological artifice may reach its deepest dilemma in our emerging age of biotechnology. With human evolution, nature may have finally turned the tables on natural selection. As the learning animal, we have evolved not so much for adaptation as for adaptability. Our creative imagination and rational capacity seem to have lifted us above the forceful current of the flow of direct material evolution, placed us far enough beyond the reach, its reach to turn back and make decisions that may influence our own evolutionary direction in the future. Here, the issue of beauty becomes particularly crucial. 
the ambitions and aspirations of individual human beings seem to have no boundaries, and this is especially true in the quest for beauty. Human beings have always sought to transform themselves in the direction of their desires. But where is the stopping point? We might say that using our technology to go from the bottom of the bell curve to the mean is a normal movement. But where would it stop? We will not be satisfied in um, what, what will our goals be? Where will we be satisfied? When will we be beautiful enough? It's like the labor leader who was asked, uh, what are your ultimate goals? And he said, we will not be satisfied until every worker in America is, a, is making above average wages. <laughs> so in intelligence or talents or beauty, who among us really wants to be just average? So th these are all people who underwent cosmetic surgery. And I think we shouldn't moralize this, but we should also realize how, how dangerous this potentially could be. So what is this thing, beauty? Human beings transform themselves. It's evident all across cultures. They operate on their own bodies. They express themselves through their bodies. So when we get to biotechnology, what, look at that strangely extending the length of the neck. Um, what, what will we do if we do these kind of things with our low tech? What will we do with our high tech? Where will we go with this? Um, will we end up like Michael Jackson? I, I shouldn't criticize him, but it, it raises really profound questions. Um, so will we produce a cosmetic underclass? Will parents who meet, and both of whom have had cosmetic surgery be disappointed when they see what their children look like? Will the breadth of human variation narrow? Will we become ever great, ever more intolerant of those who don't have, I mean, nowadays, people who don't have orthodontia look, look strangely, dug, I, I don't know, out of place. And yet, I, I've gotten to like crooked teeth. I'm bored by the homogeneity of our code, but you know, you can see where it would all go. Uh, will children become increasingly be considered products with quality controls, or is this too pessimistic? In, the, in an article in the Journal of the American Medical Association, physician Leona Cutter report, reported some years ago that six out of 10 children receiving growth hormone are not actually growth hormone deficiency. Some have other medical problems that stunt growth, but many receive treatments because their parents, as she writes, are driven by a cultural heightism that permeates American society. Furthermore, there are studies looking into the possibility of using growth hormone for other things like anti-aging. But this also seems somehow predictable and obvious, doesn't it? It's like a logical extension of our current attitude towards cosmetic, cosmetic surgery. Yet, it seems obvious and an extension until one stops to actually ask what's going on. How are we remaking ourselves at these levels of biotechnology? It's very deep in our existence. It's, if you think about it, it might be that what's appropriate for the surface of our bodies is not appropriate for the inner workings of our bodies. But in our prideful self-persuasion that we can transform the meaning of the body and bodily being, become artists of our own creation, um, we need to not underestimate the danger of all this. When I think about the meaning of it all, vanity and violence, the primary drives are the most fundamental evolutionary impulse and possibilities implied by our increasing powers. It occurs to me that there may be, for human beings, one more meaning to the concept of beauty, one final evolutionary filter that may determine our destiny. When I think about the meaning of beauty we have spoken of so far, these meanings are all in some ways cruel. Bodies, wealth, social status, success, preference and prejudice, surface images and plastic perfection, rejection, racism, shifting standards, 
self-absorption, self-conscious, shame, trivialization, inconsequential preoccupations. Will we all become its victims, enslaved to its preoccupations? It's, it is increasing and interesting, increasing now this interesting, that grooming in animals is a response to basic anxiety. So we need to address that question that's driving our sense of self uh, insufficiency, inadequacy. Um, we need to avoid letting this go right through the center of our lives as three shifts, work, home, and beauty. The average woman is not Cindy Crawford. The average American woman is five foot four, 145 pounds, and asymmetrical. It's been noted that in the environment of our evolutionary adaptation, we would probably never see a single individual as ideal and as alluring as the standard fare of our television, movies, and magazines. But beyond our daily dissatisfaction, we are all destined to grow old, decay, and become this embodied disgust that we have such a reaction to. My point there is that even if you are the most beautiful woman on earth, um, you grow old. My father was a physician in New York City and he took care of Greta Garbo. He liked her very much, but he told me, you know, she was still beautiful as an old woman, but she, she grew old. She had to contend with that. Somehow there's something sickening about all this if we don't see what's going on in a deeper level, as though something is missing in that we are not contending with a real issue when we preoccupy by ourselves the way we do with beauty. It's an interesting thing that when people become wealthy, they often become bored with the qualities that, remember, um, can you believe that? Remember Rudy Giuliani got one when he was at a convention? And he said, oh, it's my wife, I have to take it? You know, I don't know that. Anyway, um, it, it's an interesting thing about beauty. I'm going to fast forward here. Um, the, when people become um, really wealthy, they often get bored with the things that um, many people, most people want, pleasures and social prestige. And it's not surprising, if you think about it, that they would turn and become <coughs> interested in the relationship of something deeper. Suffering, struggle, the more profound and poignant expressions of the beauty of the human spirit. This being, of course, a picture of Vincent van Gogh, whose, at one point, was his paintings was, one of his paintings was the highest price ever paid for a work of art. So this is compelling, too, and there's a beauty um, I, I meant to start my lecture with a quote that said, beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. It's a quote from Isaiah and from Romans. And, and there's something very powerful about it. And it, likewise, there's something very troubling about using our technology like we did to the forests of Lebanon. This is where the cedars of Lebanon came off of this hillside. And it's never recovered. So the question is, what will happen if we as a species use our biotechnology in this way, that we, we change the surface, what we want on the surface, but we don't go deep in. This is, by the way, a sapphire, a modern version of a sapphire that's almost virtually indistinguishable except to an absolute expert. Um, but this, this change, the blue, is only in the very outside. So you have to ask yourself, so you, your boyfriend comes to you and he gives you your engagement ring and it's a sapphire, and you say, oh, you know, Bobby, you shouldn't have spent so much money for this. It's so beautiful. Thank you so much. I'm so touched. And he says, oh, no, don't worry. I, I know we, we're going to need money later. And so I, I didn't spend a lot of money. It was, uh, you know, $32 over <laughs> eBay. And it's the, the, the color is only in the outside, but who cares? Because that's what you see. You know, that's, you know there's something wrong with that. You can feel it right away, that the inner quality has to be there. The inner quality is something far richer, and it, the deep source of beauty is that. Truth, goodness, and beauty. Human nature can be seen as a flight from desperation and ascent to aspiration. 
beauty in its true and fullest form, has promise, mystery, hope, and open aspiration. It has become, it has everything to do with self-transformation at the deepest levels, but it can only do so if it will be truly open to and contend with the reality of disgust. Yeah, just one more minute. Perhaps it's time that we, as a culture, and most specifically in the medical center, raise some issues about this, because we, we are very quickly tending to a culture that forgets the deep and noble sentiments of things and turns toward a superficial uh, extension of, of, our, of our lesser impulses. My thoughts keep coming back to little St. Francis. Perhaps no man ever walked the world with a greater joy for the beauty of life. He's well known for his appreciation of the natural order and his communion with the creatures. What is less known is the story of his courageous self-surrender, his willing abnegation of all the beauties of his privileged life of prosperity, health, and pleasure. He freely gave up his wealth and position and turned to care for the wretched, repulsive bodies of the outcast lepers. And there he found the resonant reaches of the beauty of love. Will we now turn and use the extraordinary powers of our advancing biotechnology in the pursuit of vanity? The United, the United Nations reports that 20,000 children under the age of five die every day from starvation and diseases related to malnutrition. Can we ever truly feel beautiful when this is in our world? Thanks so much, Dr. Hobart, for that really uh, rich and thought-provoking presentation. It'd be a shame if we didn't have some questions now. So uh, maybe we can have just a couple of questions. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, but uh, if you keep it short, please. Um, right at the back. Yep, um, thank you for that. That was uh, brilliant and profound. My question is about how should we think about the role of science um, in informing our uh, beliefs about beauty? Uh, because we recognize for the other transcendentals, there's a difference between opinion and fact. I can think something that's true Good, but it's not good. Uh, is science revealing what we think is beautiful or what is actually beautiful? And yeah. how should we even think about that distinction? That, that's a really crucial question. And, and uh, that was actually the subcurrent of what I was trying to say here. Uh, one, one of the participants, maybe he's here today, came to me last night and asked me what I thought about the theory of evolution, whether we had it right. And, you know, I haven't absolutely studied it, but my sense is that there has been, over the course of history, a material evolution. And if that's true, then it would have, a lot of what we are and feel as human beings would have been driven by those, those forces and those currents. What I was trying to do here was to explain that that is not incompatible with the notion that through this process, even the forces of attraction, then finally beauty in its both basic biological form, then its more cultural forms, and then its higher spiritual forms, are also emerging in this process, this, this dramatic panoply of phylogeny. And that in fact, it's, it's reasonable to interpret the world as the Catholic community has, has no f fundamental fight with evolution. It's, been, it's open to discussion and consideration, but it's, it, it was the Pope himself said, it's more than a theory. It's, there's a huge amount of evidence for a material process of evolution. But the problem is that the scientists who are, tend to investigate the biological and the psychological dimensions of this, for some reason they use their, they overextend their, their methodology. They, they start making pronouncements that are of an ideological, uh, theological sort. And they assume that the whole world came from cruel forces. And therefore, they tell us that, that evolution itself has to be only about certain things and not about higher spiritual things, but that's, that's not a just interpretation of the facts. And that's what I was trying to show here, is that it's possible to make a case that, that through the process of phylogeny, a creature emerged who was actually kind of climbed up and opened the top of the, the, the submarine and looked out and saw something more. And I, I mean, I certainly think the evidence is very great for that. What was St. Francis doing? What was Mother Teresa doing? That th their lives, they left no offspring of the material sort, and yet look at the power of their lives. 
And look at the central power, by the way, of sacrifice in human life, drawing on the more the core prototypical sacrifice of Christ himself. Without that dimension of human existence, human society would collapse. It's self-evident that that, that is at once has biological, material meaning, moral, and by implication, spiritual meanings. So that's absolutely the right question to ask, and we need to hold the scientists to the deeper vision of the truth, and that's why Notre Dame is so important. Yes? Well, you know, as a physician, I have to contend with this. And I, I, I'll tell you, I'll be very medical about this, so I don't want to shock anybody. But, but I, I had several experiences when, when I was a medical student that made me more sympathetic to this whole notion of interventions. And then also so deeper and deeper qualms about it all. So I, I, I started, I, I did a rotation in plastic surgery and I, I saw a woman in for her sixth facelift. And yet at the same time, this was a woman who, and usually facelifts make people happy for about two years, and then they start to feel ugly again, they have to have another one. And I, I, I saw a girl that had a very sort of retracted jaw, and she just desperately wanted to have her face more right. And she was, it seemed to me she was happier after she did that. And, and I mean, none of us would, most of us would not object if a person was born with a huge wart on the tip of their nose. You wouldn't say, well, that's you. It, you know, you'd say, well, that's just a, an accident of nature. Well, to the, to the secular scientist, nature is all accidents. It's all the kind of cruelty and contingency of a process that had no, no inbuilt telos, no fundamental alignment with deep purposes, truth, beauty, goodness. It's just a coincidence within a chaos. And for those people, interventions, uh, according to their light of what's good and beautiful and, and functionally uh, helpful to them personally or collectively is, is, is okay for that. I, I just think it's too superficial of an approach. And I think our, our Protestant um, brothers and sisters who favored eugenics weren't going deep enough into the, into the question. That's a, the fundamental problem. But would we, would we intervene now to try to overcome <coughs> certain superficial um, but, but powerful things genetically, uh, maybe? And we, we've got to find a way that balances off. Um, the, we have to address these one at a time ethically, not just make categorical condemnations. Because I, I think there's some role for cosmetic surgery even beyond uh, reconstructive surgery. It's a very, very hard call. But the problem is that our values become increasingly um, focused on superficial things and that we don't, we lose both collectively and individually when we allow ourselves to become preoccupied with beauty, but it's not, not hard to do that. I, I, of course, have to see what Kim Kardashian's doing every day. <laughs> and, I, I mean, it's, it's just a very profound thing. And, and last time I was here, I spoke about uh, the new revolution in gene editing technology, that's really going to be something. And we have to prepare ourselves with deeper values before these challenges hit us. Because up till now, you know, we've thought of changing this or that, but genes aren't Legos. You can't just plug in one and plug in the other. It's not like Mr. Potato Head. 
put on a prettier nose. It's, it's much more complex than that. And what we'll lose is very basic features of our humanity if we do this.